Hello and welcome back to Energy Lab. In today's video, we're going to look at how space technology can help the floating solar revolution. This is relevant as in our last video to the World Islands, we've seen that grid connection for the World Islands is not in sight and that their base case solution to get energy is running 100% on diesel generators. We want to assess what the optimal energy solution for the World Islands is. And for this purpose, we have invited in today's video some subject matter experts from Clint Solar and from Anaware. We are going to assess in the third video which of the options for energy solutions are optimal. We're going to look at grid connection, running 100% on diesel generators and hybrid solution of solar, battery and diesel generators. If you want to make sure you don't miss the third part of the series about the World Island and the conclusion basically, make sure to subscribe to Energy Lab. Today, I have the pleasure of welcoming two subject matter experts. One is Musna Al Alawai from Anaware, and the second one is Evan Kevelan from Clint Solar. Welcome. I want to start off with Evan. Evan. Clint Solar is using space technology for floating solar. Recently, Clint Solar has been invited to join the incubator program of ESA, the European Space Agency, I guess the equivalent of NASA, but in Europe. How come that Clint Solar is using space technology to assess sites for floating solar? Hi, Stefan. Yes, thanks for having me. So as you know, um, we are combining satellite data and machine learning with floating solar. And this is very exciting because as you know, floating solar is growing tremendously quickly to the extent that it's often called the third pillar of solar energy along with uh, utility scale and uh, rooftop solar. And IHS Marquit, they predict that the growth from 2019 to 2020 for floating solar is almost 150%. And this is significant. And uh, what in Glint Solar, we have seen the majority of the growth in Asia Pacific, but it's also moving now into Europe, um, to the Americas, and also to uh, the Middle East, thanks to you guys at Anywhere. So what we saw was the need to provide solar developers with better tools to identify and analyze the very best sites for floating solar, because the risk elements are quite different than uh, ground-mounted solar. So what we're doing is using satellite imagery and analysis going back 40 years in time on an hourly resolution to help mitigate the risk so you know what site you're dealing with, essentially reducing the risk quite substantially. And this is a revolutionary way of, of doing it, we think. This seems like a very novel approach, Evan. Um, and I agree with you that the floating solar market seems to be growing quite rapidly. What do you think are the main drivers for the fast growth of floating solar? There are several contributing uh, factors. So availability of land area is a huge one. In many countries, available land for ground-mounted solar or other large renewable energy project is both difficult to obtain and increasingly um, hard to come by. Whereas huge population centers are often located near either reservoirs or near shore areas where floating solar can be installed. And in certain places, there are also other, other benefits, such as both a reduction in algae growth and a reduction in the water evaporation. And especially as the planet is warming up, the reduction in water evaporation can be a, a major benefit for, for floating solar. But it's really the, the energy yield from the water cooling that moves the needle on an LCOE basis for floating solar. So on a floating solar versus a ground-mounted solar comparison, we have seen that the floating solar have higher energy yield of as much as 18% versus the reference ground-mounted case. And of course, this depends on, on the cooling um, effect, which varies greatly depending on where you are in the world and, and the technology being used. But the World Bank estimates that the LCOE you know, on a floating area is around 10% higher than ground-mounted solar. But this is a base case where you have a 7% discount rate, but only a 5% higher cooling effect. So of course we know that it can be significantly higher, which then 
increases the, the cost gap, making floating solar much more efficient. So it's with these benefits in mind that we in Clint Solar, we want to accelerate the growth of floating solar, and we're very bullish on the future. Very interesting. What kind of data are you actually collecting as part of your site analysis? Solar irradiation is, of course, the very foundation of our analysis. But we saw the need to move beyond this and create a tool that was uniquely designed for floating solar project developers. We therefore gather data on wind, waves, temperature both on the surface and in the air to calculate uh, the temperature coefficient and looking at what kind of extra yield you get from the floating solar project. And this we do going back 40 years looking at data on an hourly resolution. And on lakes we can analyze the water presence and how the water changes over time to determine is this lake dry for parts of the year, which is of course is, is crucial uh, for the floating solar project. If the site is in a mountainous region, we can create a local heat map by looking at far shading to determine what is the optimal placement, what is the optimal site on this particular lake. We also use satellite imagery to look at questions relating to logistics. So for instance, what is the distance from the nearest shore to the project site? And with supplier data, you can calculate capex costs related to this logistics. And there are significant differences between the suppliers. So for instance, how many kilowatts of installed capacity can you fit into a 20-foot container. Evan, you mentioned also that Glint Solar can help the developers identify the best sites for the floating solar. Can you tell me more about that? Yeah, so what we have seen is that many project developers around the world are site agnostic. So they just want to find the best sites for building out their solar project. So what we in Galintola are doing is developing a tool that helps them scan a region by looking at hundreds, if not thousands of potential sites, and then shortlisting these based on some of the parameters already mentioned, then coming up with a shortlist of the best suited 10 or 15 sites in that region. And from those, we can do a deeper dig and come up with uh, maybe one or two ideal sites. And here we're also looking at distance to the grid, which is of course is a major capex driver, and also ownership to determine what is the what is the ownership structure on that specific land or water area. Evan, so concluding, Glint Solar's involvement in this series about the World Island is going to be that you're going to do an assessment for the feasibility of floating solar for the World Islands in the third video of the series. Is that correct? That's right, Stefan. Thanks, Evan. Uh, what you're doing sounds really exciting and I agree with you. Uh, the future surely is a lot to do with data, having more data, and I'm convinced that your service is going to drive the growth of floating solar going forward. Good luck to you. Thanks. And actually, I'll meet you or I'll see you again in the next video uh, on the World Islands. Yes, correct, which we're very excited about. Now let's move on to Mosna from Anaware. Once the developer sort of has completed the feasibility studies and gives the go-ahead, then the EPC phase starts, the engineering, procurement and construction. And worldwide, there are only a handful of companies that have experience with floating solar on seawater. Anaware is one of them. Musna, what are sort of the differences between floating solar on seawater versus sweet water? Thanks for having me, Stefan. I believe the main difference observed in freshwater bodies such as lakes, dams, basins, so on and so forth is the fact that waves tend to be much calmer when compared to open sea environments and wave load is a major hydrographic factor to consider when designing a stable floating structure. To give you a rough example, our floating solar structure is moored in its position with 14 concrete blocks each weighing 5 tons and that's a total of 70 tons. Now if this structure is implemented on fresh water the total mass of concrete anchor blocks required will reduce by not less than 20%, depending on the location, of course. When Anaware deployed the floating solar structure, there was a lot of interest. We got contacted by Bloomberg, by the local media, but also by research institutions that are researching floating solar. Because Anaware is one of the few companies that has experience with onshore and offshore solar, 
there is a lot of interest in, in that and basically in the performance of onshore versus offshore solar. Musna, can you talk a little bit about what we have seen so far about the differences between onshore solar versus offshore solar plants? We have made a comparison between our floating structure and our own land solar plants present in the same island and we have come up with a few conclusions. The main difference we've noticed is energy production. The evaporation of water under the solar motors causes a cooling effect. Because of this, the PV cells of a floating solar plant is around 60% cooler than the PV cells of an on-land solar plant. PV cells perform better at cooler temperature, therefore, a floating solar plant is more efficient than a typical on-land solar plant. For our floating structure, we have recorded a solar yield that is 23% more than the solar yield of our ground mount and rooftop structures. But this is also because the PV modules we use for the floating solar plant is brand new and is more efficient itself. Lastly, regarding cleaning, our floating solar structure has a solar capacity of 80 kilowatt peak and it takes six man hours to clean the entire structure. When compared to our on-land solar plants, it takes about four man hours cleaning the entire structure having the same solar capacity. Musna, how difficult is the maintenance of the floating solar plant? Firstly, we actually do not have a walkway from the shore to the floating structure. Therefore, we either have to use an inflatable kayak or swim to the structure ourselves, which is about 30 meters away from the shoreline. Fortunately, our floating structure has walkways for all and purposes. However, the walkway itself is not very still and could cause imbalance, especially during windy days. Muzna, prior to the actual floating solar project, you must have done a lot of research. You must have contacted a number of companies. And I know that sort of anchoring the system, uh, the, the floating structure. These were critical points of your research. What have you learned as part of your research and actually what have you learned now that the system has been operating for a while on the anchoring and the floating structure? Research and development is actually one of the main purposes of our floating solar projects. Therefore, we have a pretty good list of lessons learned to improve our implementation efficiency for future floating solar projects. To name a few, when placing our concrete anchor blocks, we relied solely on Google Maps coordinates, which is not particularly accurate, especially on water. Therefore, the best thing to do for future projects is either to use a boat with an inbuilt GPS or a marine grade GPS. Secondly, during implementation, we have noticed a slight discrepancy in the water depth. And I believe this is because we have done the bathymetric survey seven months prior to our implementation date. I believe the best thing to do for future projects is to do a bathymetric survey not more than two months prior to the implementation date. Lastly, pulling the assembled structure from the shore to the sea was pretty time consuming. And this is because of two reasons. First reason being that half of the floating structure was actually still on the shore. Therefore, the friction force between the sand and the HDPE floating body made it a bit hard for the boats to push the structure to the shore. Therefore, our team had to manually push the seven ton structure to the water completely before the boat can pull it to the final position. The second reason being that we only had one boat which was able to tow a structure. I think the more convenient way is either to use two boats or a boat with a higher horsepower to make it more easier to pull the structure to its final position. Mosna. Evan before mentioned that changes in sea level is a critical component for the floating solar structure. And I guess we as Anaware have seen these challenges already on our floating solar structure on Nurai Island. Can you elaborate a little bit on that? In our current floating structure, which is located off the coast of Zainara Island, the maximum water variation is about two meters and this is due to low and high tide. This data is very crucial when choosing the right anchor chain length. If the chain length is designed based on the average wavelength, during the highest tide, the chain will be abruptly tense and this is due to the natural wave motions. This could actually cause a massive shock to the structure which could lead to fatigue and failure over time. Thanks Mosna, that's great. Uh, and thanks again also to Evan. This concludes our second video on the World Islands. Uh, in the next video, Clint Solar is going to use its space technology to assess the feasibility of floating solar for the World Islands. And Anaware is going to do a comprehensive analysis on the best energy solutions for the World Islands. They're going to look at grid connection, running it 100% on diesel generators and the hybrid solution of solar, battery and diesel. And going to assess which one is the best for the World Islands.
If you did enjoy this video, please subscribe to Energy Lab and press the like button. See you next week. Bye. Thank you.